ordinances, statutes, regulations, and disputes that affect people and businesses interacting through computers. Cyber law addresses issues of online speech and business that arise because of the nature of the medium, including intellectual property rights, free speech, privacy, e-commerce and safety, as well as questions of jurisdiction. Cyber law encompasses a wide variety of federal, state, and local laws and regulations in the United States, along with international treaties and laws of other countries. The Internet is ubiquitous in people's lives, and cyber law is at the heart of many legal issues today. Cyber law intersects with many other areas of the law, including torts, contracts, intellectual property, and criminal law. Since the Internet is a dynamic medium that is constantly changing, cyber law also changes rapidly in response to changes in technology. In our introductory module, we will define cyber law's parameters and consider some of the most common cyber law issues. We will first examine jurisdiction over cyber law litigation and where disputing parties can adjudicate cyber law disputes. Next, we'll look at commonly included clauses in online agreements and contracts. Finally, we'll learn how courts enforce judgments, including cases in which they must be enforced in multiple states. Jurisdiction. Jurisdiction is the initial question in any lawsuit. It's a question of whether a court has the power to hear a dispute and resolve it. The first type of jurisdiction is subject matter jurisdiction, or jurisdiction over the nature of the case. Subject matter jurisdiction is the extent to which a court can rule on the conduct of people or the status of things. For example, federal district courts have exclusive jurisdiction to decide patent infringement cases, including business method patents for software companies. Additionally, when a cyber law dispute arises over trademark and copyright infringement, a federal court will have subject matter jurisdiction to resolve the dispute. State courts, however, usually hear tort claims, such as defamation, invasion of privacy, and garden variety contract claims. Second is personal jurisdiction, a court's power to bind a defendant with its ruling. Personal jurisdiction involves a defendant's personal rights and or property interests such as determining who owns a parcel of real estate and is an oft-litigated concern in cyber law cases involving websites and e-commerce. The due process clauses in the 5th and 14th Amendments to the Constitution have been interpreted to limit courts' authority to exercise powers over non-resident defendants. The due process clause of the 5th Amendment states that no person shall be deprived of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. The 14th Amendment, which extended the principle of due process to state and local governments, states that no state shall deprive any person of life, liberty, or property without the due process of law. A seminal personal jurisdiction case was International Shoe Co. v. Washington, in which the Supreme Court held that a state could exercise personal jurisdiction over a defendant if the defendant had minimum contacts with the state of Washington and when it was fair for the non-resident defendant to have to defend the lawsuit there. Thus, the first important question in analyzing lawsuits against out-of-state websites involves personal jurisdiction. If a website written and hosted in Georgia posts false information that a user in Iowa relies on to her detriment, the question becomes whether, under the principles of international shoe and its subsequent line of cases, an Iowa court can exercise jurisdiction over the sponsors of the Georgia-based website. Some courts use a sliding scale to determine whether a website owner or operator has sufficient minimum contacts to invoke personal jurisdiction. Courts have held that passive websites that are used only for informational purposes, even if they include advertisements, are not sufficient to establish minimum contacts to support exercise of personal jurisdiction over a non-resident defendant. A court is more likely to recognize personal jurisdiction when a defendant maintains an interactive website, a website that engages in repeated contacts and transmissions, or that allows visitors to enter into contracts using the website. For example, in Bichetto v. Hansing, the Court of Appeals for the Ninth Circuit applied the minimum context test set forth in International Shoe to dismiss a lawsuit brought by a California-based plaintiff who purchased an automobile on eBay from a seller in Wisconsin. The Federal Appeals Court held that the Wisconsin seller did not have sufficient contacts with the state of California for California to exercise jurisdiction over him. It reasoned that a single sale of an item over eBay doesn't amount to the requisite level to constitute minimum contacts. 
Every state has enacted long-arm statutes, which purport to allow the state to exercise jurisdiction over non-resident defendants who have contacts with the state where the case is filed, to allow the state courts to exercise personal jurisdiction over non-resident defendants. For example, South Carolina long-arm statutes provide that a court in South Carolina may exercise personal jurisdiction over a person who acts directly or by an agent as to a cause of action arising from the persons transacting any business in this state. The question usually becomes whether the application of a long-arm statute in a given case offends the constitutional due process clauses under a minimum contacts analysis. The minimum contact requirement is also considered satisfied if the defendant purposefully directs substantial activities to the forum state. So, for example, if an e-commerce website routinely sells goods to buyers in, say, Michigan, it is highly probable that Michigan courts will have personal jurisdiction over cases involving Michigan plaintiffs injured by products sold through an e-commerce site. Parties may, however, waive their right to contest personal jurisdiction. A waiver is the voluntary relinquishment or abandonment of a legal right or advantage. A person may consent to personal jurisdiction expressly or by implication. For example, parties may sign an agreement in which they both consent to personal jurisdiction in a given state. Moreover, even when a valid personal jurisdiction defense exists, a party can implicitly waive the defense by failing to raise it in a timely fashion. Therefore, a defendant challenging personal jurisdiction should raise the objection when its opponent first files the lawsuit. In one case involving alleged defamatory statements made online, a third-party website host operator defended itself by arguing that there was a lack of personal jurisdiction over it. The Court of Appeals for the Seventh Circuit disagreed and held the defendant waived its defense by participating in the district court proceedings, which included briefing and oral arguments addressing the merits of the claims. The host never pursued the personal jurisdiction defense before its appeal, so it was no longer a valid defense. If a defendant wants to participate in a lawsuit and avoid a default judgment, but still preserve a potential challenge based on personal jurisdiction, it can make a special appearance in which it appears solely to challenge the personal jurisdiction of the court. If the court finds there is jurisdiction and the case subsequently goes forward, the defendant will thus have preserved the issue for appeal. Become a cybersecurity professional.